Welcome to the Health Science Podcast, sponsored by the National Health Association. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and today I'm absolutely delighted to have a very special guest, an international star, so to speak, who is the president and founder of the Complementary Medical Association in the UK, uh, Ms. Janie Goddard. And Janie is uh, trained really as a homeopathic physician in her training. She's got training in many areas, including neuro-linguistic programming, body-mind medicine. And she has been at the forefront over decades providing standards for complementary and integrative uh, medical care. She's the uh, a, a journalist who is an, a featured writer for Natural, Natural Health Magazine, which is uh, also an international periodical in, of a sort. She is the uh, best-selling author of at least four books and the most recent, Rewind Your Body Clock, which is the uh, kind of complete and natural guide for creating a happier, healthier, younger you. Janie, welcome. I'm so excited that you're here. Welcome to the Health Science Podcast, brought to you by the National Health Association, the oldest organization in the world, championing the extraordinary benefits of a whole plant food diet and healthy lifestyle, as well as water-only fasting. We believe that health results from healthful living and focus on evidence-based science that promotes the health of you and your loved ones as well as the health of all animals and the environment. We feature experts from a cross section of disciplines within the plant nutrition, vegan, psychological, environmental, and animal compassion sectors. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, the NHA's Director of Health Education. Thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute delight. And I also want to say thank you so much uh, for the wonderful glowing introduction. I'm not sure how I'm going to be able to live up to that, but, uh, but also to thank the NHA for having me because it's a wonderful opportunity to be able to speak to this, uh, this group about topics that we all hold so dear. Well, Janie, let me jump right in because I think it's worthwhile for people to have a little definition from you being the the kind of the uh, the maven that you have been in complementary medicine. Yeah. Define, if you can, simply complementary medicine and integrative care exactly. and how that became such a major passion in your life, setting the standards for that kind of care mm. as you have. And we'll get into this for many governments across the world. Yes. Um, so can you give a simple definition and then talk in relationship to your own journey, why mm. that's such a significant piece of uh, why, why it's so significant for you. Yes, of course. Thank you. It's a great question and a wonderful way to kick off. So uh, in the UK, we use the term complementary medicine. Um, and uh, so what, what essentially that means is it's almost an equivalent to the term integrative medicine uh, that you use more predominantly in the US and in other countries as well. Um, so the two terms can be used pretty much interchangeably. The idea is that um, the work that we do in this field complements conventional medicine in many, many ways. So for example, um, where we are really sort of major, if you like, and where we really uh, can contribute massively to the health of society is by really taking um, a, a, sort of an, a long view approach where we are very excellent at treating chronic disease, chronic illnesses that conventional medicine doesn't really or can't really address because it's so locked into the, the big pharma model. Now, having said that, to really clarify, um, if one were unfortunate enough to, um, I don't know, fall over, break your leg, of course, you're not going to go to see your, your local acupuncturist or your local homeopath or your local herbalist. You, what you'll be doing is you'll be running straight to, well, no, you won't be running, you'll be going straight to the hospital, probably in an ambulance. But by the same token, there are things that we can do within the field of complementary medicine that can actually assist in speeding up and improving the healing process. So um, the other sort of areas that we really uh, sort of major in, so to speak, are things like lifestyle approaches. Um, so it's all of the things that all of the doctors, all the brilliant doctors who are associated, and yourself included, Frank, in the NHA, for example, it's all of the sorts of things that we all talk about um, all the time. Lifestyle, uh, stress response management, uh, things like uh, managing your sleep, managing your hydration, all of the, all of the work that we do, obviously, uh, completely whole food, plant-based diet, 
SOS free. So I know we're all singing from the same hymn sheet there. So that essentially is, is where we sort of how we define complementary medicine. So I like to say, if somebody says to me, uh, for example, over here, uh, what, uh, what is complementary medicine? I'll say it's actually everything that, um, every sort of form of healthcare that is not under the umbrella, umbrella of conventional medicine. So we do all of the other things that conventional medicine doesn't do and can't actually touch. Um, so for example, if you've got, uh, let's say a patient who's a type one diabetic, um, the likes of me and my colleagues, we're not going to be taking that person off insulin. But what we can do is that we can assist them with their lifestyle modifications in so many different ways that enable them to live healthily with what was formerly an absolutely devastating health condition with, with horrendous outcomes if the lifestyle approaches were not addressed. So I hope that sort of serves to illustrate a little bit of the, the way that we work. Yeah, so for our audience, which is looking on what's pre something presented by the National Health Association, which historically were all of the biological requirements of natural hygiene that would support the outcome of the of health that the body is manifesting all the time, yeah. you would classify all of those supportive conditions under this kind of complementary system, including therapeutic systems, for example, that are not under mainstream medicine, for example, massage and acupuncture and chiropractic care and a lot of ancillary systems, including the lifestyle factors would all kind of come under this umbrella. That's exactly or what you're right. doing. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Because in, right. in America, integrative care usually relates to someone who's doing typical medical intervention, but then may add something that's not quite uh, under the medical umbrella, so to speak, as you oh. described. So yes. we're on the same page with our audience um, here. That's right. I mean, for example, uh, a really great resource to see exactly how this is handled in the US is um, NCCAM. And uh, they are a government run organization there in the States. And they are the people who are funding research in this field and, and so on. And so actually, they are very, they're very much into funding uh, nutritional studies, uh, things like massage studies, things like touch for health um, studies, and so on. So, you know, it's they are very open. And it's still Still early days, although I've been slogging away at the coal face for the last 35 years uh, in this field, um, you know, it's still sort of in its infancy. But where we are in the UK, and I think it's not dissimilar in the US, is it's becoming increasingly difficult to actually see a doctor a conventional doctor, either face to face or even catch them on, on Zoom or the phone. Um, and this is a post COVID phenomenon. And it's becoming very, very difficult, as you'll be aware, for example, in the UK, we have a, a government health system, the National Health Service, NHS. Um, and it's very, very sad that uh, all of the doctors through no fault of their own have just been defunded and defunded and defunded. So what we're now seeing is that the public are starting to ask questions, and they're starting to look at various other options. Um, and so they are starting to really realize that they can come to uh, the likes of me, the likes of you, Frank, and other really highly qualified practitioners. Well, the frustration I think here that has occurred is that many physicians have realized with the pressures of patient load and insurance systems in the United States, for example, that the average time of an office visit is a matter of minutes. Mm -hmm. So a number of these physicians have gone into what they call concierge practices, where they actually allow a certain number of patients to buy a membership. They cap the number of people they'll see in a year. And that way, that person has access to that doctor, you know, anytime that they want. So that's one of the things that's come out of the kind of frustration that you describe. But let me let me step it back a, a step. Let me take it back a step because I wanna understand that this has been such an incredible passion. And as you said, you've created this organization that has been really setting the standards for these kinds of care over, the, over a 30 year period. What drove that passion in you? What was part of your personal journey that led you to want to do that? I mean, it's not an easy thing to do. What you accomplish is pretty magnificent. I mean, running any business for 30 years under the stipulations of all the pressures of economy and everything around us is a very difficult thing to do. And you have been very accomplished in being able to do that for a 30 year period. But what drove that passion to even want to do that? 
what drove your passion and interest in, in complementary medicine? And then what drove your interest in really establishing the standards, the way that you have actually moved in your life? Okay, that's a great question. Thank you. Let me first of all um, answer the question, uh, why did I set up the CMA in the first place? And then I then need to come back, if you remind me, if you don't mind, make a note or something, but just to remind me because I know I'll forget. Um, if, if we can then sort of circle back to talk about what drove me um, into complementary medicine, because it's a little bit chicken and egg. Uh, but um, the reason I set up the CMA 30 years ago uh, was because I'd graduated from a seven year training in homeopathic medicine. And I had the enormous privilege of being incredibly fortunate. Uh, what happened was that the, my training school, my college, was actually based at, it was on the campus of a, a, a school called Imperial College. Um, Imperial College in the UK, it's the Imperial College of Science, Technology and Medicine. It's essentially the, equip, it's sort of the equivalent to MIT. Uh, but obviously in, in the States. And um, so it's an extraordinary um, academic institution and one of the world's leading universities, of course. Anyway, the, the, so, so my school that I was at, um, they actually uh, spent time on the campus there. And as a result, our teachers uh, for things like anatomy, physiology and pathology, um, it was very a very elegant solution to um, muddle up the conventional med medical students in with the homeopathic medical students. So we were all put together in the same room and we all benefited from these most extraordinary lecturers and lectures. And um, so we had this incredibly evidence-based training right the way through, just as a, a regular med student would, right the way through to sort of being going to the, the cadaver dissection labs and, and so on and so forth. So I had that, that element to my training, um, which was a huge privilege. And I'm, I, that's not lost on me. And I'm forever grateful for it because it's driven this need in me, this recognition that we really need because we, the, the field of complementary medicine, natural health care and so on is always accused of being woo-woo or woolly or pseudoscience and so on. And of course, nothing could be further from the truth, as we now know. Um, but this has always driven me to sort of really foster the uh, and, and to publicise the massive evidence base in this field. So anyway, just cut, cutting back, though, so I'd, I'd graduated um, from my training and uh, uh, we were sort of brainwashed back in the day, 30 years ago, uh, to believe that all you need to do was just sort of essentially open your door. And now you're a fully fledged homeopath and the public are going to beat a path to, to come and be treated by you. Obviously, nothing was further from the truth. And so um, I was sort of feeling rather frustrated. And it's interesting, I graduated from a class of 30 people and only two of us managed to actually go into practice and get you know thriving practices up and running. I was one of them and another lady was another. What we realized our common denominator was that we both had had quite a lot of exposure to marketing and sales and so on, you know, in, in our past lives. And uh, so we were able to actually kind of make a go of things. But I was talking at the time to other practitioner friends of mine, a reflexologist, a psychosynthesis counselor, um, a nutritionist. And I was saying, so ladies, I said, how's, how's your practice going? And uh, they would say, well, mm, nah, it's just not. Um, and I sort of started putting pieces together and realizing that actually um, nothing was being done to help us actually grow thriving practices. And um, it was quite shocking, actually. We were members of these organizations. They were giving us insurance and um, providing us with a lovely uh, newsletter every so often and so on. But it was all very cottage industry. It was all very homespun. Um, and there was no professionalism. So I really thought, well, actually, what we need to do is to drag complementary medicine um, and Back in those days, we also sometimes used to use the term alternative medicine, although that's very much fallen out of favour. Um, but we, you know, we need to drag this kicking and screaming into the 21st century and beyond. Um, so what do we do? We professionalise it. And so I created a really strong brand. I created the most, the most extraordinary, back in those days, leaflets, um, uh, just wonderful things that, that people had never seen the likes of before. It was so professional, so slick so beautifully produced. Um, and this is a wake up call. People were just not used to seeing things of this sort of quality 
in the field, in the environment uh, back then. Um, and of course, this was pre-internet days. Uh, so, you know, everything was done by phone and by letter. And oh my goodness, I mean, I, you know, I just, I think about it, I get some of the, the old leaflets out and think, actually, that was really impressive. That would still impress me nowadays. Uh, but anyway, so so that was it. So so none of us were were actually thriving uh, terribly well in practice. Just very very few of us. Um, so I realised and I looked around what was going on to support all of these practitioners. But furthermore, what was being done to protect the public. And what was also being done to educate doctors so that they knew what we did was legit, was OK, we were thoroughly well trained, um, so that they could then start to refer people to the likes of us. And so I realised that a really robust organisation needed to exist, and it was crucial for me that it was a non-profit uh, in order to maintain absolute transparency and to be open to everybody in the field. Um, because there were a lot of egos flying around in those days, and there are still a lot of egos in the field, um, but we wanted to step outside all of that sort of um, difficult stuff going on and actually just be this uh, wonderful organization that was very open, very transparent and was literally there to support everybody in whatever way we could. So this whole um, organization was driven out of a desire to essentially be of service, uh, as crazy as that may sound. Um, I certainly didn't go into the CMA and think, I know what I'm going to do to make a load of money. Um, I'm going to go and set up this organization. Had I known how hard it was, my goodness, I don't know that I would be sitting here 30 years later talking to you about this organization. It has been so hard. But one of the problems back then was that there was no there were no standards in the field. Uh, so literally anybody could slap a posh brass plaque up outside their front door and say, I'm a practitioner of nutrition, of massage, of chiropractic, of osteopathy, of homeopathy, of herbal medicine. And there was nothing out there to say yes or no, and are you safe or are you not, or are you a complete charlatan? So this is what I realized very quickly, and I realized that we had to do something to protect the public, so the public knew who was legit and who wasn't. So um, essentially, it all started off being UK based, and now we're completely global. Uh, we have members on every continent and uh, we are onboarding 30 new members a week at the moment. Uh, we are extraordinarily busy and just growing and growing and growing and so we represent training schools, practitioners, students, um, even approved suppliers. So this little thing that started off as a sort of a, just a helping concept has grown and grown and grown and grown exponentially and I use the word um, advisedly because it is it is exponential, it's the most extraordinary thing. And uh, yeah, so it's been it's been a labor of love uh, that has just turned out really, really well. And it's been very helpful to people. Well, we're, we're gonna, before you go on, we're gonna just take a few moments uh, to hear from our sponsor, the National Health Association. I'm here with Janie Goddard, the president and founder of the Complementary Medical Association, and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Health Science Podcast Show. I want to remind you to visit the National Health Association website, where you'll find incredible resources to support your healthy lifestyle, including plant-exclusive eating without added salt, oil, and sugar. Simply go to healthscience.org or nationalhealthassociation.org. Be sure to check out membership, which is only $35 per year for those living within the United States and $55 for those living outside the US. You'll be amazed at all the information and benefits you'll receive. As a member, you're kept up to date on the latest evidence-based tools for health promotion. You'll receive the incomparable quarterly magazine, Health Science, a beautiful 40-page advertising-free publication, mailed to your home or offices, loaded with articles, recipes, inspirational stories, and interviews with world leaders in the fields of personal health, plant-based nutrition, water-only fasting, animal rights, and environmental support. And you'll receive details about life-changing events, such as the extraordinary annual conference of the National Health Association and diverse opportunities for plant-exclusive NHA cruises and travel vacations to exotic destinations around the globe. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and now 
back to the show. Welcome back to the Health Science Podcast, sponsored by the National Health Association. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and I'm here with uh, Janie Goddard, uh, who's talking about her role in establishing uh, this incredible global organization, the Complementary Medical Association, and the impact it's had on setting standards for the practices and procedures and therapists that are that participate in this kind of care and service to the public. And I got to tell people, they should know this, that through your efforts, uh, you've you've garnished awards that are really very profound for the kind of effort and, and work that you've done with governments and standard setting. You're a fellow in the Royal Academy of, of, of Medicine and Public Health, and you're also an honorary advisor on Ayurveda and naturopathy for the Kingdom of Nepal. So your reach has really gone far beyond the borders of that little country, the UK. Yeah. Um, and also, I think people should know, and you can maybe speak to this, that you at one point were even involved in the White House, White House Commission in the US for establishing standards on complementary medical care. So talk about that a little bit and your foray into uh, our crazy country and the work you've done on a governmental level even here. Yes, absolutely, of course. Well, um, it's always quite funny because uh, I've done, I've, I've worked with so at governmental level with so many different countries, including many of the former Iron Curtain countries, and uh, and and this was all uh, in an effort to help to essentially set standards, standardise uh, treatments across the different disciplines across the board, so that everybody, so the governments knew what was being offered, and they knew that everything was safe, and 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 that patients would be. Uh, benefit would able be able to benefit, and that uh, there were there was er um, empirical evidence uh, supporting everything that I was explaining needed to be done. Um, this is driven by this is driven out of setting the national occupational standards for the various complementary medical disciplines uh, in the UK. So I was involved in all of that, and then creating committees uh, in order to be able to get all of that up and running. And then I was invited uh, by the White House Commission. At that time, it's called the White House. Commission on Alternative and Complementary Medicine. Um, I My job was to go and testify, having done a load of research, was to go and testify in front of the White House Commission. So it was a great big, uh, a great big panel of, of the great and the good uh, in the field of medicine across the board at that time. And I had to make my recommendations as to how to standardize um, offerings across all 50 states of the US. Um, and uh, it was very well received. In fact, uh, the recommendations that I made were accepted by the board unanimously. So it did sort of play into. Well, that's probably fed into, as, I mean, I don't know the data on this, but it's probably fed into the bit of the explosion in lifestyle medicine that, of course, has become more rampant across yeah. the, the United States itself. And, and, and let me let me address that a little bit, too, because um, when we talk about lifestyle medicine or in this case, complementary medicine and these self-help approaches that are a little bit out of the mainstream, uh, of course, the thing that's been explosive in lifestyle medicine has been the the real gravitation toward, you know, plant based living and eating, knowing the the power that this kind of nutrition has for helping people resolve the most devastating diseases that we suffer with in our cultures. Uh, and I know to you that's been a big piece, and I know there's been an explosion of that kind of veganism and, and plant-exclusive uh, mentality of nutrition in the UK. Can you speak to the importance of that in your own personal life? I know it helped you resolve some major health issues that mm -hmm. you've dealt with through the years. But speak to that and the growing and, and the growth of that mentality yeah. of plant exclusive living the way that we are teaching it and how that's spreading in your eyes across Europe, England and these other countries that we're not quite connected to. Yes, of course. Well, first and foremost, um, in the UK, we are, there are more vegans per capita in the UK than any other country in the world, I believe. Um, and I think that's, that statistic is, is still, still valid. Um, it's very interesting. A lot of that is driven not so much from a health perspective. So we're not really seeing plant-based uh, eaters, for example, uh, but we are seeing compassionate veganism absolutely skyrocketing. Uh, the UK is a very sort of animal, uh, a, a big, you know, we're, we're a big nation 
of animal lovers, big old softies. Um, but it's very interesting uh, that uh, so, so that's happening. However, what is also happening is that uh, people are starting to see that there are massive health gains. Um, that are accru accruing to people who start eating plant-based diets. Now, obviously, we, we've got to sort of, um, it's a very interesting thing. As we all know, you can be a super unhealthy vegan. And there are a lot of people out there who are compassionate vegans, they're ethical vegans, and they just really love junk food. And that's absolutely fine. But nevertheless, because they're still removing all of the deleterious uh, things like the, 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 the plant, you know, the animal proteins, uh, the dairy, um, eggs and meat and fish and so on and so forth from their diets, they, even though they're still eating sort of uh, donuts and drinking their, their Coke and things like this, you know, um, they are actually still benefiting somewhat. And I think this then starts to get the, the kind of the, the cogs churning. And uh, I think people are starting to think, oh, this is actually looking quite good. Maybe I'll start, uh, maybe I'll start sort of eating a little bit more healthily. There are also many, many, many um, vegans who are also health conscious. And uh, so are eating a whole food, plant exclusive, SOS free diet. Um, I have to say, I've been writing for, na uh, for uh, not just the Complementary Medical Association for 30 years, um, obviously promoting all of this stuff but of course also have been writing uh, for the UK's most influential health uh, magazine it's a glossy women's monthly magazine up there on the shelves alongside your Marie Claire's your Cosmos your Vogue's and all the rest of it it is beautiful it's called Natural Health Magazine and my column uh, my, my monthly column is essentially their natural uh, positive aging uh, column how we can age really well and maintain our, our biological a youthful biological status um, um, and uh, anyway, of course, I've been using that as my my soapbox uh, uh, from which to expound the benefits of eating plants and uh, and and being healthy and well. And and actually, you know, and it's not just from the health perspective, but also from the planetary perspective, and also, of course, from the animal uh, welfare perspective as well. So all of those together um, have been warmly embraced by that magazine. That magazine um, then has then a few years ago after they saw the sort of response that my columns were getting they then opted to only uh, publish uh, vegan recipes whole food vegan recipes um, and so yeah it was it's been a very very interesting thing to observe and it is the zeitgeist in the UK um, everybody's eating plants most of our uh, university campuses now are absolutely plant exclusive uh, within their, their cafeterias and restaurants. Well, so you know, for, for my for my side of the equation, I mean, when we look at health, we know that a lot of these processed vegan foods can be too high in oil and salt and other things. But intriguingly, yeah. a couple of pieces that are important to me, and I'm, I'm sure they're important to you. Number one, they bring people into the fold. And at this point, I'm, I'm for anything that does that because, you know, all of the devastation that's going on in personal health, planetary health, the species the damage, uh, by uh, adopting even meat substitutions that are vegan, we find that there's a huge reduction of impact on carbon emissions in the environment. So, yes. you know, look, it's not ideal, but it certainly has its own benefits. And as we educate people more about improving the quality of their vegan choices, that will also improve. Yes. And so, um, you know, to me, that's a big issue. But I, I do want to go into this idea that as you write for Natural Health magazine that you spoke, uh, you've been coined with the moniker of being the, I guess, the national youth guru of the UK is what I saw. Anyway. Uh the UK's leading nat uh, natural youth guru is what they call it. Yeah, well, th that ties together. That ties together with something we want to talk about, and that, of course, is your best-selling book, "Rewind Your Body Clock." And and I think uh, we we want to touch on that in this discussion because it's a, a really profound book on helping people understand these complementary solutions to kind of aging younger if you yeah. will, or really helping to slow down the typical aging process that many people experience. So talk about your motivation for the field of aging, for what drove you to want to put that book out. And then maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the highlights of that book that people can use at home as a way to kind of monitor their own progress and how they are individually aging. 
So, Frank, thank you so much for asking about the book. Um, it was a very important book to me to, to write. And uh, I had no idea how it was going to be received. You know, you, you do this sort of work and, and you know yourself and you just you know that it's important content, but and you just don't know how it's going to land out there anyway. Um, I, I just felt that the information was important because it's all about how we can not just um, sort of pause our biological aging process, but also how we can even prevent those diseases we really wrongly associate with being a natural part of the aging process. Of course, I'm talking about the, the cancers, the heart disease, you know, the lifestyle mediated illnesses, things like uh, autoimmune conditions, which we will talk about in a moment, uh, right the way through to the neurological conditions, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's and, and more. And there's great evidence that we know uh, that shows that we can actually modulate uh, the, uh, the way that these diseases either appear so they express or they don't or we can actually start to either halt their progression or actually start to have them recede um, and this can all be achieved by many of the techniques and approaches in the book and besides you know these approaches uh, that are sort of really rooted in nutrition stress response management and and all of the other things that we all teach about um, what's so wonderful is that these make us happier healthier younger more cognitively brilliant uh, brighter minded and just more optimistic and sexier and and feeling more youthful and so on so what could be you know what could possibly be wrong with that it's just a wonderful win 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 all the way around anyway so the whole point um of, of why this book shocked me so much was the reception to it because on the day it was published which was the uh, 19th of april um back in 19 uh, sorry 20 2019, um, it literally came out of the blocks and went straight into number one of, of the Amazon charts of all books on Amazon, not just the in, in its little section, but all books, including the fiction books and all the rest of it. So I, of course, I just massively screenshot that again and again. I was flabbergasted. It was then uh, uh, taken by the Daily Mail and serialized twice. And uh, I was shocked at how well this little book did. Um, the thing was that, uh, to answer your question, I made it super, super useful, um, even to the extent of including at the back, because of course I realized I was giving people a lot, eat this, do this exercise, uh, do this stress response ma re management, do this uh, meditation, get this much sleep, drink this much fluid, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, use these herbs, manage your hormones, modulate your hormone expression here, modulate your inflammation, uh, reduce the chronic inflammation and your predisposition towards that. And so such a laundry list of all the things that you're asking people to do in the field of holistic wellness. And so you've got to somehow create a framework um, and it became very apparent when I was doing the book so in the end at the end of the book I laid it all out your 21 day rewind plan and it's like a little tech uh, sort of checklist that people can work through week one do this week two do this week three do this and anybody can do anything for a week let's face it and it made it very very consumable and very very successful for people because they got immediate immediate results right out of the blocks so uh it's a it's a fabulous book um as i say it's called rewind your body clock and uh, it has just gone absolute gangbusters um i narrated the um the audio book as well so that's been great it's gone into translation in various other countries and of course it's available as an ebook as well and i have an accompanying website um it's called it's janiegoddard.org and um, or .com you'll get there either way and um, we on that website i actually created an evidence-based um biological age tracking system completely free for all my site visitors to use the idea is that you go into this system it's completely anonymous i don't know who's in there um, i don't know what your results are none of my team know what your results are but each month you plug in your results of a series of little easy to do tests that you can easily do at home there's a flexibility test there's an eyesight test there's a reaction speed test there's a flexibility test a strength test um and uh, 
is there anything else? Oh yeah, and a, so six actually, and a skin pinch test. Um, all of these tests have been used in aging and gerontology scenarios to actually be able to monitor um, age progression without going into the depths of testing telomere length, for example, um, and so, which of course can be, is invasive, and of course it is it's mildly invasive, but of course it's also actually very, very expensive. So the idea is that I wanted to create this wonderful set of tests that have this really robust algorithm, so I did, um, and so each month you plug your results in and it gives you a little feed out, a little graph, and then you come back the next month, it sends you an email, it says do your tests again a month later, and uh, so then you'll do your test plug in your results it will then actually show you how your age your age rewind progression is going um and so for example if your skin pinch test is really really good it means that you you know that part of your system is starting to to really respond to the changes the lifestyle changes you'll make but let's say your balance is not quite as good as it was last month well What's, what's that about? What do you need to do? Do you need to do more walking? Do you need to do more balance exercises? Do you need to start walking on slightly rougher terrain to kind of shift things around for your body so that you can get all that, all of those receptors really pinging and firing? So the reason I became, to answer your question, Frank, the reason I became so, uh, I'm going to use the word slightly obsessed, um, about the aging process and biological aging is because I drew the genetic short straw and due to life events and so on, um, adverse childhood events and so on and so forth, as we know people with adverse childhood events are far more likely to develop very serious chronic conditions in mid age. I was no exception to the rule and I um, went literally from being a super fit ballet dancer with a six pack uh, to three weeks later being completely bedbound after getting all these weird sort of aches and pains and really strange swelling around my Achilles tendons. And of course, because I was a, a sort of a, you know, I was a, about 30 years old at the time, I just sort of thought, oh my goodness, because I've beaten up my body as a ballet dancer for all these years. And uh, so I thought, oh, well, you know, what can it possibly, can't possibly be anything serious. Little did I know, three weeks later, I was in a wheelchair absolutely completely immobile and fully dependent upon others um, and I unfortunately had drawn the genetic short straw that meant that I developed and produced um, all the symptoms and pathology of rheumatoid arthritis the autoimmune condition now just to clarify things for our viewers uh, rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune condition it's a systemic illness that means that it presents in, in the majority of times and situations and scenarios as massive overwhelming excruciating joint pain um, however there's a lot more going on than that because it's driven by the um, out of control production of inflammatory cytokines, particularly cytokines, um, hormonal messengers uh, like IL-6, interleukin-6, for example. Um, you also have massively upregulated production of things like tumor necrosis, alpha TNFA. And uh, so when you've got all of these things going on in your body, all these signaling hormones that are telling your body to essentially attack itself and to pr produce massive overwhelming inflammation, it doesn't just affect the joints, it affects every single part of your body. Um, so as I say, within three weeks, I was suddenly locked into a wheelchair. Um, the situation just got worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And then my inflammation levels just went absolutely catastrophic. Um, and I became extraordinarily unwell. Uh, my body just went into this, this sort of cachexia state. Uh, my body catabolized all of my muscle and I literally lost all of my muscle, pretty much most of my body fat. And I just really was skill, essentially skeletal. I'd gone down to about 85 pounds, um, five stone, four, four and a half, five stone thereabouts. And I couldn't move. I was locked into my body had just contracted into a fetal position. Um, my only option, as far as the conventional medicine, me medical folks were concerned, was chemotherapy at this point. Now, of course, because of my work in, in the field of complementary medicine, uh, I knew that that was not an option for me because I was so desperately ill. 
Um, so I was actually put into hospice care because I was so profoundly unwell that they really did think that there was no chance I was going to last longer than a couple of weeks. And they, they said to me, get your affairs in order because, you know, you're not going to make it. And there was some part of me that just thought, no, I completely will not and do not accept what you're telling me. This does not feel like a reality for me. Um, so I was in care and uh, I was essentially being being looked after by these incredible angelic nurses and and uh, and staff at this amazing place. In fact, it was an old folks place. It was a it was a hospice very much for old folks. And I was the only young person. So I guess I was a bit of a novelty. So I had not just my friends coming in, um, helping me with um, different types of uh, therapy and, and so on and so forth. But also, of course, I had wonderful nurses coming and talking to me. And there's so much value in socialization, what we know from the field of, of, uh, of um, age, aging and gerontology and so on, is that socialization and working with friends towards a common goal can add up to nine healthy years to your lifespan, which is amazing. I mean, that's an extraordinary figure. Um, and it, it's, it seems again and again and again to hold true. So I was getting so much benefit inadvertently from all of these scenarios. But when I was there, a friend came along and um, he said, look, I've got this newfangled thing. It's going to test your biological age. I'm saying, well, what's that then? I didn't know what it was. And he said, oh, well, it's the age you are, not in years, because we know how old you are now. By this time, I was I was 38 by, by, by this particular, 37, 38, something like that. He said, so we know you're 37, you know, 37, let's say, I think I was 37 at the time that I did this test. He said, but what we're going to do is going to measure you biologically and see how old you really are. And I thought, oh, interesting. Okay, well, we'll give it a go. And my biological age came out at 55. And so obviously that unable to move in excruciating physical pain, um, trying to do sort of physio and so on with friends. And it was, I can't even begin to tell you how painful things were. Um, I had no muscle to speak of. And uh, it was absolutely, it was just, it was just the worst case scenario you can imagine. Um, and of course, all my other uh, organs and so on were affected. My brain was inflamed, lungs, kidney, liver, everything, um, uh, my, my gut, everything was massively inflamed. And uh, so uh, we were doing our best. And it ultimately, uh, what happened was that they moved me out of that facility because they said, look, you haven't, you know, your trajectory has not been what we thought it would be. Uh, we've kept you here for four weeks, um, but obviously you're still very, very, very seriously ill. But can we please move you because we need the bed? I said, yeah, fine. OK. So they moved me to another facility uh, where I was for six months and I still really wasn't able to, to move. I certainly couldn't move under my own steam. I could be moved slightly, but I couldn't move under my own steam. But I was getting better and better and better by little tiny English increments. Um, and ultimately, uh, I, I'd set goals for myself. Uh, my goal was that I was going to learn to walk again somehow by hook or by crook. And so I arranged my own rehab. I arranged my own kind of uh, physio program. Um, I uh, managed to start to get to the stage where I could wheel the wheelchair very, very slowly to get to the physio room. Um, and I remember very clearly, I will never forget it, was actually trying to stand up out of the wheelchair. And when you have no muscle, you haven't been able to stand for many, many years, and you have no muscle, the pain of trying to stand and learning to stand again and learning to walk again, you know, people think, oh, it must be hard to learn to walk again. Yes, it's hard, but nobody tells you about the pain. And it is, you can't describe it. It is off the charts. Um, but, you know, you have to push through because you've got this inkling and this target and you know you can do it. Um, and so this is how I, this is sort of why I became so entranced because I thought, I've got this biolog biological age measurement of 55. I can't accept that. So when I was in this facility, I was looking at all of the things that I could do to start to essentially rewind my body clock, get biologically younger. Um, coincidentally, at that time, 
I had various friends coming in. They didn't know each other, but they all said to me, what you need to do is you need to go on to a whole food plant-based diet. Now, I'll be honest with you, at the time, I really thought, oh gosh, you know, come on. I'm, I'm eating a really healthy diet. I'm doing, this is the 90s. I'm doing what everybody says is healthy. I'm eating oily fish because it's got all of those omega-3 essential fatty acids in it, which uh, essentially they, they reduce your inflammation. That's what we believed at the time. I'm eating salads, you know, because, uh, you know, that that should, you know, that's good. Um, maybe the odd glass of red wine because it's got resveratrol. So, you know, that's going to help. And and so, of course, I was very, very naive and I didn't know. But we didn't know that much back in the in the 90, early 90s. And um, anyway, long story short, um, all of these different people independently said, you've got to go off and get this sorted out. Go, uh, go to this place in America and go and get yourself sorted out. Get onto a whole food, plant-based diet, raw vegan, blah, blah, blah. In the end, I was just fed up with everybody nagging at me, so I did. I went off, I did that three-week program, um, I went there in a wheelchair, having been told I would never walk again. Um, and I was at this point making little baby steps because I was, you know, training myself and, and, and so on to try to stand and walk again and so on. And I absolutely, I'm not joking when I say that three weeks later, I was literally up and walking. And not only that, I was walking three miles up and down the beach every day and then coming back and doing back to back yoga and Pilates classes. I mean, it's like a miracle. And it is just extraordinary. And here's the funny thing. Of course, that was wonderful. I mean, it was a, it was just for me, it was completely miraculous. But the strange thing was I did that biological age test again with my friend and my biological age had regressed from 55 to 27. So it was way, way older than my biological age. And by this point, I was 38. And when we retested and I'd biologically regressed to 27, so I was actually nine years biologically younger than my actual chronological age. So this stuff works. Um, so really, I guess the takeaway for anybody watching this, if you have autoimmune illness, if you know anybody who's dealing with autoimmune illnesses, what we know is that with these particular conditions, what underpins them is absolute runaway chronic uh, inflammation. We know that. We also know that there is a huge component of, in most cases, leaky gut. Um, so where the, the junctions, the gut junctions, and I know you can speak to this brilliantly, Frank, uh, the junctions in the gut are, are not tight enough. They're not robust enough. And so molecules that shouldn't be getting out into your body do get through the, the, the gut wall. These are picked up and due to a phenomenon called uh, molecular mimicry, your body goes, oh, what are these? What are these things in, in the body? That shouldn't be there. Oh, look, that's, an anim that's, a, that's a protein. That's a foreign protein. That shouldn't be there. So it primes your immune system, in the case of rheumatoid arthritis, for example, then to go on a scavenger hunt around the body to go and find anything else that resembles this molecule. So for example, in the case of rheumatoid arthritis, um, connective tissue. So that's, that explains the joint involvement uh, in, in rheumatoid arthritis. In, in multiple sclerosis, of course, we see another slightly different case of molecular mimicry where the body's going on a scavenger hunt for the fatty sheath, the myelin sheath that surrounds nerves and starts nibbling away and destroying that. So all of these autoimmune conditions, um, and they just come out with a wonderful piece of research just published yesterday in fibromyalgia, where they're actually viewing fibromyalgia as a form of autoimmunity that causes um, pain signaling molecules to migrate to the ends of nerves, uh, which it explains the strange uh, pain points around the body in fibromyalgia. So there's a lot of uh, stuff that logically we now understand what it is and why these conditions respond to a whole food plant-based SOS free diet so extraordinarily well. And so for me, um, making that nutritional change was just like night and day. It absolutely changed everything. Now, I will admit I have had uh, joint replacements. I had two knee replacements. But who's to say 
as a ballerina that I wouldn't have had to have had those anyway, because this is what happens with, with ballet dancers. We basically trash our bodies. Um, I've got joint involvement, as you probably noticed in my hands. But you know what? That's just one of those things. You know, I'm functional. I'm in complete remission. And I travel all over the world. I speak all over the world and um, just talk about um obviously plant-based nutrition, lifestyle medicine, and all of these things, and teach at major universities around the world, because this stuff works. I'm not the first, I'm not the last. I'm certainly, you know, I'm not unique in any way, any way, shape, or form. But I just hope that I've got, and I'm driving and, and hoping to develop a big enough platform to be able to really help people who are suffering um, or help the loved ones of people who are suffering in order to be able to embrace these lifestyle changes that we know and the evidence says. Well, I, you know, after 45 plus years of clinical experience with this, I can echo that when we combine and when we use the plant exclusive living, it is truly the best way to reduce systemic inflammation. And then, of course, we've even added the option in terms of, of autoimmune problems mm -hmm. to use therapeutic water fasting, which is another incredible adjunct to helping resolve the devastating outcome of these autoimmune problems. So your experience is echoed through a long clinical experience in this organization, in the NHA, and a lot of the doctors who have been applying both the nutritional principles mm -hmm. and even the fasting principles. But let me let me touch on one thing before we separate today, and that is, um, and this is something that's important for both you and I, and that is the whole issue of mind-body medicine. And, and I know you had an experience of being able to work with the granddaddy of mind-body medicine, Herbert Benson, up at the Benson uh, he, uh, Henry Institute at Harvard. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that experience has led you to create a really incredible online program on resilience and positive psychology, uh, again, creating health through happiness. So with the little bit of time we have left, speak to that whole issue of happiness, resilience, and just touch on that a bit. And let's emphasize how important that piece is in terms of complementary approaches and lifestyle approaches for promoting a, a, a higher level of wellness and an opportunity for health and well-being. Absolutely, Frank. Thank you. It's a, it's a really important part of the uh, of the picture. So I have two courses. One is uh, Resilience and Positive Psychology, Creating Health Through Happiness. That's a professional course for practitioners to upskill them with the evidence-based knowledge that they need in order to be able to take that into their practices and to use these um, well-proven techniques, things like mindfulness, things like gratitude, things like uh, acts of kindness, loving kindness meditation, and, and so on. All of these things have an absolute wealth of, of supporting data. Um, so that the, the reason this is so important, um, probably more so now than ever in many ways, is that we find ourselves in a post-COVID world where we're not just suffering from the effects of the stress and the isolation and of everything that happened as a result of lockdowns and all sorts of things going on. Um, but also we now find that we're in a massively stressful scenario whereby uh, we are we're, we're living through recessions, financial recessions, the likes of which have never been seen before. Um, and so this is causing just inordinate amounts of stress. Um, in fact, actually, several uh, researchers have said we are experiencing a tsunami of mental health issues. Um, and it's not just to do with COVID, but it's also to do with the sequelae following COVID and, and lockdown and all the rest of it. So, so that's why I've been wanting to share the work of Dr. Benson and all of the other giants. I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, of course, we all are. Um, but it's so important for practitioners to have these skills, to be able to really add that dimension into their practices of supporting people. But I also have a couple of trainings. Uh, the one that's running at the moment is my uh, Mindfulness and Resilience Academy. It's a year-long training for people who want to become 
coaches, mindfulness and resilience coaches. It's a fantastic training. Um, the, the, the recipients, um, the, the, the course uh, students are just loving it. The recipients of this information just going absolutely crazy for it. And then the next academy that I have starting again, another year long training is a coaching course for people who want to become um, holistic health and life, and, and sorry, start again, holistic health and longevity coaches. And um, again, this is just such important stuff. We've got to get this out there because there are doctors, let's say for example, in the UK, we've got various doctors who are superb at getting the lifestyle medicine message out there's Dr. Michael Mosley, who happens to be the BBC's head doctor. So he is push, push, push the lifestyle medicine um, agenda, the, the uh, plant-based, uh, vegan, dare I say, agenda, um, because he's coming at it from a planetary, animal and health perspective as well. And of course, um, we've also got Dr. Rang Rangan Chatterjee. And so these people all together are really pushing our agenda, the NHA type of agenda as well. So that's fantastic. But the point is we need more skilled individuals out there because people can't get to see doctors. If they're just not able to make appointments, the, the appointments just don't exist. So we've got to have people out there supporting the public in making lifestyle change that will actually not just keep them alive, but also massively contribute to society. Because if people, if, if, if poor health, if ill health continues on its current trajectory, um, so I'm talking about the obesity pandemic. I'm talking about the stress, the mental health pandemic. Um, we're talking about things like uh, you know, life stress, um, insomnia, all of these things that are dramatically contributing to dr dreadful ill health. Um, for example, I don't know how many of our viewers actually know this, but in the USA alone at the moment, you're spending $333 million an hour just treating um, obesity. That's not treating type two diabetes or other lifestyle problems and illnesses and conditions that are coming about as a result of obesity. This is just treating obesity. You're spending 14 billion a year on treating childhood obesity. Now, if that doesn't blow everybody's mind, I just know this is this is 30, 333 million per hour. I mean, it's just you can't even you can't even uh, you know calculate or, or envisage these sums in your head. Um, so my goodness, we've got to do something about this because if we don't, if we don't get this under control, if we don't get these lifestyle mediated diseases under control, what's going to happen is society is going to absolutely crumble. There won't be enough money in the pot to support people in a few years. Um, in the UK, we have pensions at the moment, but because people are getting so very, very ill, chronically ill towards the end of their lives, and that um, disease span is increasing. So people are getting chronically ill younger than ever. And I know it's exactly the same in the States. So where's the money going to come from to actually look after these people? You know, we, 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 if, if society is going to carry on in any way that is going to be sustainable, we've got to address these issues. And unfortunately, you know, there are vested interests within big pharma, um, obviously big agriculture, um, you know, big chemical, big food and all the rest of it, that really would rather keep everybody just ill enough to keep using and needing their um, ghastly uh, products. Um, I keep saying we need to reframe, we shouldn't be calling ourselves patients, we should be calling ourselves customers, um, as far as big pharma is concerned. Um, and I'm certainly not fla you know, flavor of the month with big pharma by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but, you know, I think we have to say it as it is. Well, I want to, you know, uh, I want to emphasize too, that on the, the website that is on our show notes, janiegoddard.org or janiegoddard.com, you have a number of resources that are free for people to use to help uh, in terms of meditation and stress response management techniques that are available to people on that site. So they should know that they can go to that. And I, I really, I want to really thank you today for taking the time to share your information, your experience, your heart. It's been a, a remarkable uh, miss for benefit for our audience out here. And, uh, and I really want to thank you for that. Um, and I also uh, want to urge our viewers to follow Janie uh, 
Again, her location online will be in the show notes, as you see, and they will be in the show notes when you see this. And I uh, truly want to thank um, the audience out there, because without you, we couldn't do what we do. And I want to thank you for really being part of this active, healthy community. And uh, on behalf of the National Health Association, the NHA, I want to thank you for being part of uh, and being and joining us today. And uh, I will look forward to seeing you on the next show of the Health Science Podcast. And I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino. Thank you. Thank you so much, Frank. Thank you for having me. Thanks to the NHA for having me. It's been amazing. I just want to, if I can add my little piece to that, and that is that um, I had the immense privilege of coming to the NHA conference, uh, just, just gone. And um, it was unbelievable, outstanding. I can't even begin to emphasize the quality of the speakers, uh, the quality of the entire thing. The, the organization is absolutely second to none. It's certainly the best event I ever go to. So I want to urge you to support the NHA in any way you can. Become a member, become a lifetime member. Um, it is such a precious organization. It's initiatives like this that we have to support if we want to have any kind of a healthy future at all. So thank you so much for having me. It's been such a privilege. You've been listening to the Health Science Podcast, brought to you by the National Health Association. Thank you for joining us today and for your commitment to evidence-based health science that backs a whole food plant-exclusive lifestyle and contributes to the well-being of all people, animals, and our environment. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino. Be sure to leave a rating and a review, and we'll see you on the next show.